ทัสสะบัคควาโทวาระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสนะโมทัสสะบัคควาโทอาระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสนะโมทัสสะบัคควาโทอาระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะอภารุตธาเดสังมัตสัทวราเยสุรวันทาบามุจันทุสัทธา This is the um, Observance nights, and it's very auspicious to have uh, Ajahn s a j i t o and his uh, monks and nuns here for this time, this for this week. Uh, to support and help each other, encourage each other in practice Dharma practice. In the monastic life, uh, a, as k a l y a n a m i t a s we uh, the value of sangha is a, is a encouragement, support, underlying support, common goal, common aspiration, uh, common tradition and form that we all use. Our n a m a v i n a y a our tradition. Is something that we we all uh, have in common. Something that we can use uh, to reflect our often, oftentimes the glaring differences and and uh, in terms of character, personality, nationality, etc. All the things that that can uh, that we can dwell on that are different, though. It's important to recognize the common bond that which which binds us together as a as a samana sangha. And th- th- these days, there's so many in the Buddhist world in the West. There's so many uh, people have so many views and opinions about monastics, monks, nuns. Lay people, lay teachers. Uh, whether you need to go all the way and become a monk or a nun, or whether you can you can uh, become enlightened without becoming a monk or a nun, or with uh, what is it? All these kind of uh, speculations. Uh, people are interested in wanting to know how to do it, how to get enlightened, or how to. Be liberated from suffering, or uh, realize nibbana, uh, salvation, liberation, freedom. All these words imply uh, an ultimate realization, in which we we uh, break through the delusions uh, that we have about ourselves and the world that we live in. And the Buddha's uh, direct pointing at the problem is uh, the basic delusion we have: the avicca, uh, the ignorance of the suffering, its causes, the ignorance of the cessation of suffering, ignorance of the of the eightfold path. And this is what, when we use the word avicca. It implies this kind of thing doesn't, doesn't mean ignorance of in 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 uh, other ways like not knowing things about worldly situation. But this is having not explored, investigated, uh, contemplated, reflected, not having with insight penetrated the truth of the way it is. Then our relationship to the world, to each other, to the Tradition or to the society uh, will always be uh, a source of suffering for us. Mm. 
because this realm that we're in is a realm of, of it's a very painful realm to be born into this basically being human being uh, on planet earth is the experience of sensation it's sensitive it's painful yeah, we have to live with so many uh, so much pain and, and anguish and and despair grief loss separation from the loved having to put up with having to bear with uh, irritations aggravations frustrations uh, miserable situations there's the aging process the body goes through and and the uh, varieties of pain and sickness, disease, death and all this is, is a part of this realm, is the experience that, that we have when we're living in this realm as human beings. So this is this is kind of normal. There's nothing we're not we're not I'm not complaining about it. I'm not saying it should be any other way, but we're recognizing that it's this way. Uh, this is the way it is. That as long as we seek uh, uh, to attach and and identify with this with this realm that we're living in, with the body we have, or with the uh, feeling, with the with the uh, perceptions, mental formations, with consciousness, when we attach, identify, uh, and believe that these are ourselves, and of course we create more suffering around the natural suffering that we experience. The, the natural unsatisfactoriness that is uh, conveyed in the, in the uh, un, uh, that is the, the nature of the conditioned realm. So when we when we investigate this realm that we're living in, it means we're not looking at it in terms of making value judgments or trying to uh, complain about it or to think that we can somehow transform the conditioned realm into something that would be permanently better, permanently more beautiful, permanently more pleasurable, and then uh, we we realize that in the say in Western Europe in the past 50 years, there's been enormous effort put forth in trying to to create uh, that kind of experience, kind of uh, materialist world of luxury and stability, uh, materialism. Uh, pleasure seeking hedonism goes into all kinds of extremities and yet even at its very best when you do have the very best of of, of it all is something basically uh, unsatisfying it, it can't really fulfill us Also, we, we have uh, an aspiration for the ultimate realization, the basic religious impulse of human beings that is common to us all in every, uh, every form of every uh, human being that was ever born has some, some kind of intuitive uh, feeling that somehow there's more to it than just the, the, this singular existence that we're experiencing as this individual and the, the mystery the unknown uh, that we sense uh, and there's something more something magnificent something marvelous in this universe where our lives can get really involved with just the uh, just trying to survive just trying to get enough food or or just barely eke out a living, trying to make our way with it, trying to uh, control the pain, the disease, the, the sense of loss, the fear of the future, the fear of death. We're just grinding ourselves into just uh, an endless kind of uh, survival creature. 
that gets depressed, disappointed, lost in our lives to become very meaningless and purposeless. So we oftentimes take to drink or drug, something to at least kind of give us a break from the uh, endless proliferations we make around uh, through negativity, through fear and desire, through doubt and worry, anxiety, through self-consciousness, obsessions with ourselves, through blaming, through through fear of being blamed and all the rest that uh, the wars, the persecution, the atrocities, the, the endless quarrels that we we see, we we experience, we hear about. Just in this century, the twentieth century, there's been a century of just uh, you know one war, one conflict after another, conflicts that uh, that are really you know you know called world wars, first, second world war, the Cold War, and plus all the innumerable uh, conflicts that go on that don't get such uh, kind of um, extreme labels they get called police actions or coup d'etats or whatever but whatever you want to call it it is a form of misery and now I don't know how many how many wars are going on at this time on this planet there are a lot and what are these caused from you know what why do we seek to solve problems or try to to uh, try to uh, make our society, try to get our societies into, trying to create a society that we think we can maybe make better or, or have some idea that it will get better if we get our way, if we win the battle uh, through these violent means, through deceit, through violence, through uh, abuse, atrocity, uh, murder and slaughter and so forth, and we think we can somehow, if we we can uh, hope to create some kind of idyllic society through such means. But in the monastic life, we're, we're looking at the internal war that goes on in the mind. And so, the, the conflicts that arise, let's say, in one's own mind, in daily life. Because we have, you know, we have ideas about how things should be. We have, you know, we, we, we would like everything to be harmonious and everybody to be honest and everybody to be uh, helpful, courteous, thoughtful, respectful, good, generous, moral, and and uh, the society to be like this, and the world we live in, we'd like ourselves to be, to, to kind of live up to these high-minded ideals, these high standards, and yet uh, emotionally we can feel just the opposite. We can feel mean, selfish, critical, uh, we want to, we can be uh, endlessly blaming, blaming ourselves, blaming others, uh, deceiving ourselves, uh, getting caught in very gross forms of desire, and and uh, so forth, so that we we have uh, we have uh, conflicts going on in the inside our mind. I used to find it very difficult before I understood what was going on, because uh, I had high aspirations and, and high standards and, and ideals for my, my life and yet it always seemed to be pulled down by my emotions. Caught in very kind of immature reactions or very selfish or, or very uh, unkind emotional habits. And yet ideally I didn't want that. I wanted to be kind, generous, good and all the rest. So then the, you end up with this judging going on, the, the, the intellect judging, the thinking, the emotions are bad or 
you should there's something wrong with me for having feeling like this for having these thoughts for having these emotions so the critic you know saying this is bad you're a bad person for thinking like this feeling like this and so the conflict goes on you try to justify it you 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 uh, rationalize all kinds of things you manage to deceive yourself a good part of the time uh, uh, but this this, this uh, confusion arises endless confusion emotional confusion uh, and uh, one just feels a sense of despair hopelessness with oneself through trying to solve one's emotional problems through through the intellect or just trying to get just suppress the emotions try to deny or uh, refuse to uh, to acknowledge them monastic life can be just based on an ideal you know just trying to be a good good monk a good nun and uh, trying to live up to the standards the ideals uh, that we we read about in the scriptures and that that will take us so far and there's uh, inspirational states of mind because we we long to aspire to being a really good monk or really good nun and then uh, we're sometimes uh, shocked and and disgusted by our own uh, emotional reactions or desires low uh, selfish uh, uh, animalistic desires that can that we can feel uh, you know are that we are also identify with and try to get rid of and deny so in the Buddha to solve this dilemma used mindfulness as the means now so mindfulness is uh, is sati as a is the is a kind of the key word uh, for Buddha's teaching and when we when we're practicing meditation then we're using uh, the intuitive ability of the mind is not a it's not, we're not rationalizing or analyzing anything uh, even though we can use those when necessary but meditation isn't isn't an analysis or a rationalization or a critique or a suppression or a denial of anything but the willingness to embrace the moment because the, the intuition is the ability that we have when we're receptive and fully awake and aware in the present. So when this uh, two lines of Pali that I chant up to the Namotasa, the gates to the deathless are open. This is this has been my theme song since I came to Amravati thirteen years ago, as many of you know. That's the that's the theme song of Amravati. The gates to the deathless are open. Amravati is the deathless realm, and uh, this, is, of course, is a metaphor. Don't ta don't think that the actual plot of land, but it is. It's also to to use this this uh, to remind ourselves that the gate, the the door, the entrance to the deathless are open. Then, the, for those who listen, who pay attention. So the soda wanta is the ability is one who listens, one who listens or sees, or pays attention, is awake, and and it's not paying attention to a condition on the uh, like reading a book uh, particularly, but it's this this uh, ability to to be awake and aware in the present, to put that kind of effort into the present moment to sustain this awareness to listen which is an expansive state of mind isn't it the, the conscious experience in the present is embracing the moment rather than discriminating uh, like concentrating on one thing uh, and uh, and and shutting out all the rest 
like with samatha meditation, we tend to do that. We tend to concentrate on one thing and and sharpen up the concentration through through suppression. And then with vipassana, we're using this intuition, which is intuitive awareness, which is to embrace the present, the totality of it, the way it is. Then the Soda Wanta, Soda Wanta, Bamunjan to Satang, to trust, to relax into this present moment with, with faith. Sada, Sada, Bamunjan to is to kind of uh, release or let go, relax into with faith. Just your ability, simple, it's a simple ability, it's not a complicated, difficult thing to do. Not like you have to spend years trying to to be mindful and trying to get it. It's not like that. It's 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 a it's a natural state that is relaxed and attentive, open, receptive in the present. So then the when we when we trust in that, then we begin to uh, recognize the way it is. For example, the, in the satipatthana, the, the body, the feelings, the mental formations, the the dhamma, the four foundations of mindfulness. So, in this is what's present here and now, isn't it? In, the, in every moment now. That here and now, the present, the Pachubana Dhamma, is what now, for, for as experience in the present, is the body, isn't that we're all experiencing the body now. How do you experience your body? You know, if you, if you analyze it through, through conceiving it as this and that, through, through the various uh, uh, kind of ways that we, we have, as they, with medical uh, terminologies or scientific terms, that's one way of trying to analyze the body as if it, I, 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 in, a, in an abstract way, through, or through looking at charts, through looking at uh, books on anatomy and physiology, or through intuition, isn't it? When we, when we just open uh, and observe the way the body is in the present, like this. So that's an intuitive ability where the, the mind is embracing or with the way the body is. It's intuitive awareness rather than, than uh, rational analysis. It's like this. And so they use the four postures, the breath. The breath is like this, sitting standing, walking, lying down, like this. We're not, we're not, it's not criticizing or saying, you know, saying how it should be, but whatever way it is, whether you're walking straight or crooked, sitting erect or, hu or hunched over, or whether you're feeling pleasure or pain or whether, whatever, it, it's not really, we're not, we're not having a standard that we, we're trying to make ourselves live up to, but just noticing beginning to trust in our ability to just observe the way it is, like this. So in that, in that moment, then the body is, is the seen for what it is. And then our relationship to it has changed from seeing it from uh, the, the sense of my body as we, we might look at it in a mirror with vanity, you know, with, and how attractive or how old do I look? They or they, uh, my complexion, and so forth. Or seeing the body merely in terms of uh, the perceptions of modern science, and uh, through through analyzing it and criticizing it, or through feeling it, being with it, because 
the we can the con the experience of consciousness in this present moment allows us gives us this ability to to let the body be a conscious experience in the present because of this intuitive ability of the mind and then the way uh, is the way feeling pleasure pain sukha dukkha dukkha matsukha vedana because this is a this is a sense experience and the pleasure pain and neutral sensation through the senses through the eyes ears nose tongue body mind the, the mind mental stage give us pleasure or pain or are neutral as well as sight sound smell taste and touch so we're we're now intuiting feeling or vedana meaning we're we're not judging it making judging or uh, criticizing it but just noticing it's like this pleasure is like this pain is like this neutral sensations like this or in through the through the eye, I mean, pleasure. When we look at beauty, is pleasure is like this attraction, isn't it? When we see something beautiful, we we feel this pull towards it. We feel attracted. Attraction is like this. When we look at something ugly, repulsive, repulsion is like this. Dukkha vedana. Then neither pleasure nor pain is like this. And so it's. It's the way it is. We're not making this up. We're not trying to fit experience into ideas we have about it or bo so-called Buddhist, uh, Buddhist ideas. We're actually observing the state of awareness, the way it is. And in the Jitanu Pasana, Saripatana, the mental state, the mood, the state of mind, the jitta is like this. Whether it's you feeling inspired or depressed or or expanded or contracted or or uh, elated or or uh, frightened or angry or greedy, jealous, envious, doubtful, uncertain, confused, miserable, stressed out, whatever. The jitta is like, it's also intuiting that by uh, the intuitive awareness allows us to, to recognize this is the way it is, but it's not judging it. Well, this is particularly, I find particularly a challenge to deal with jitta nupasana because you know, say you're having a, uh, you're feeling angry or you're feeling uh, uncertain or confused there's so much resistance wanting to get rid of it and change it but we begin to through this bamunjandu sadang by releasing letting go into the present moment we're we're not trying to make anything out of it just let it be what it is it's like this so miserable mental state is like this Then Dhammanu uh, Pasana Satipatthana. This takes us to the ultimate realization, where, where we realize the Dhamma is like this. The Amata Dhamma, the deathless, is like this. The conditioned realm is anicca dukkha nata. So the, we we see that we we use these as as reminders of the way it is, not as as ideas we put on to life. And I think this is one one of the problems with vipassana, uh, as it, as Westerners tend to practice it, is that they tend to uh, project these uh, like the idea of impermanence onto everything or suffering or unsatisfactoriness so that that uh, they they're really 
conditioning their mind to see everything through their projection rather than trusting in their ability to just observe. So anicca, dukkha, natta, these three characteristics of existence aren't positions we take uh, in order to interpret experience, but their reminders uh, help us to remember, to observe these characteristics as they're happening now. Remember the old wet blanket approach we used to do years ago, you know, you say, you look at a flower and you say, that flower is beautiful, and then you say, yeah, but it's impermanent, it's going to get old soon and wilt and then turn rotten and stink. And they think, that's, that's vipassana. <laughs> uh, which is, you know, kind of, ta- you know, uh, kind of, is in, in the way I said that was deliberately said in a state of projecting they said that uh, you shouldn't enjoy beauty because you'll get attached and then you'll suffer so you start looking at even beauty as uh, through this through some projection of suffering you know it's all miserable which leads to a kind of self delusion again it's depressing but this isn't what is this isn't mindfulness this is just trying to uh, convince yourself of something, uh, something you call Buddhism. So, we're not trying to convince ourselves, but observing that beauty is attractive. It's the way it is. It's like this. It's not making any value judgment about it. Beauty is impermanent. It's not, nothing, that's Part of this, that's that's fine. There's nothing, uh, unless you, the only suffering you have is when you want beauty to be permanent. Then you create suffering around beauty. Misery and pain is impermanent, but it tends to seem permanent. Like when you're in pain, it t- tends to seem like you know one is always afraid it's going to last forever. The idea of a hell, a realm, isn't where you're permanently in in a chronic pain, uh, miserable pain that will last forever. Is, is the kind of mental state that you have when that I have anyway. When when there's a real pain, physical pain, or, m- or physical discomfort, or even mental uh, pain. But in the with intuitive awareness and the mind is in this receptive state, non-critici- non-critical state of, of embracing the present, the pain or the, the ugliness or the pleasure or the beauty. And our response to it then is through accepting it for what it is. It's like this. When we say the way it is, it's like this. It's not, there's, there's no judgment in that. It's just, it's a way of of say reflecting on it, just to re- to to not make any judgments about it. Pleasure feels like this. So you start looking, at, start accepting the pleasure you're feeling, but not indulging in it. You're really aware of it. It's like pleasure is like this. Pain is like this. Neutral sensations like this. In the silence of the mind, then is the is the, is the uh, where the world and eternity meet, as Mr. Panikar says, Father Panikar says in those tapes. The silence is where the world and the eternity meet. Well, that's an interesting reflection for me. Well, I've contemplated that a lot. With the the uh, because in the present moment, you know, the, the one one can be very much uh, aware of the world or the emotion or the state of mind, the agitated mental state that one is experiencing, or the physical sensations in the body. And and when that dominates all our attention, then we have no way of. Of tra- of uh, then we, it just goes on and on to the next one. 
You know, the world, the samsara has this this kind of endless cycle uh, feeling to it. It just goes around and around and around. And so as long as one's attention is only on the on the uh, rupa, uh, gaya, vedana, ditta, then then there's you just want to just continually kind of processing conditions, experience, and it just goes one goes thing goes on to the next. So in in realizing the deathless, realizing the in the third noble truth, realizing of nirodha, of nibbana. Uh, Realization of anatta, like sape tama anatta, and then when you chant that, and all dhamma is anatta. Realizing anatta, non self, sunyata, emptiness, realizing uh, nirodha, cessation, realizing nibbana, non attachment. So intuition is the ability to to embrace the 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 world and eternity in the in the present. Now that sounds pretty grand, doesn't it? In in terms of uh, terminology, but through reflecting on it, you know that's what that isn't such a rare or impossible thing to do. I mean, when you think of it in terms of maybe uh, abstract thinking and, and and your intellectual abilities it it's, uh, it does sound difficult but in terms of of uh, experience it's quite normal natural thing to be able to do in that the gate to the deathless are open so in that state of attention mm-hmm. attentive awareness Intuitive awareness. Right? That, that, that's, the, that's the entrance, or that's the point, that's the intersection where they, where uh, time and the timeless. And that's what we're able to, to uh, realize in this human form, within the limitations of our humanity. We can actually realize and learn to trust in that, in that still point in the present, which paradoxically is they say the point that has no boundaries so it's like a point is this a, a dot and then but it's it's it has no circumference it's unlimited and that's where they, they, we give up the thinking kind of analytical mind trying to figure that one out and experience it realize it through its mindfulness way of of uh, contemplating and way of of opening to life, meditation in these terms isn't a shutting down and trying to control and uh, and trying to uh, kind of filter out all the coarse, unpleasant things and trying to kind of support all that's refined uh, in our lives. But it's it's uh, it's willing to flow with life because. With intuitive awareness, we, we we no longer feel the need to control experience. If we're caught in just the worldly dhammas, then there is a need to control things. We always because we we, we just get so upset or so confused or so uh, angry or so resentful or so uh, disturbed by this or that that we we do have to control. Uh, and, and exert a lot of effort to just try to survive in the world because it it just uh, the, you know it's just too too frightening too many uh, aggravations too many frustrations in it but with the enlightened mind then the mind isn't in d- doesn't need to control because uh, it's no longer uh, Something that that, that we we're, we're stuck in just going from one thing to the next. 
and we have the escape. Then this, uh, there is an escape. This is my one of my favorite quotes. I think it's from the from what? Which one is it? The uh, Udana. Well, anyway, the, the um, there is an escape from the born, the creator, the originator. And so that is that is the the world, isn't it? The world, the the body, the the uh, feelings, the uh, mental states, and all that. There's an escape from from that. Uh, you, the word escape doesn't mean escape in in out of aversion. Doesn't mean we hate the world and we're just trying to get out of it. It's not based on aversion or blaming the world. It's not that kind of escape. But it's the escape through wisdom, through seeing the nature of this is like this. And that as long as we're bound into the conditioned realm, identified, attached, lost in it, then all we, we all the best we can do is try to control it you know, for our own benefit. You know, exert, make lots of money and try to buy a nice cottage in some pleasant place and, and try to you know avoid any unpleasant scenes or unpleasant people or uh, pollution and all that you can <laughs> so instead of having to do that Say the samana. When we look at our lives here uh, as uh, as mendicants, which means that we lose a, a ability to control everything, don't we? We kind of we have we don't have any money. Uh, we have to just we accept alms food, and uh, we, we we've we've given up our ability to control our lives. And, and kind of arrange and manipulate conditions for our own benefit, protect ourselves. You're at the mercy, in that we're at the mercy of the society we're in, whether the society is merciful or merciless. Fortunately, the society is fairly merciful. So we we have this nice temple now. He can sit and good food every day and all the rest. So this is the mercy. Are we living in a merciful society rather than a merciless one? But we're dependent on on the on the mercy of this society for the basic survival with the four requisites. So that means we're we're deliberately choosing not to be in control of all that and taking the risk of uh, of of meeting mercilessness, hard-heartedness, brutality, indifference, not caring, not respecting. No reason why anybody should just respect us, uh, like me, because I'm Buddhist monk, in a, in especially in a non-Buddhist country. But the fact is that it does. It's ne never been a problem for me living in the, in Britain because uh, there is mercy there is good heartedness that there, this that the some in our life does seem to to bring out the goodness in in others brings out these merciful virtues So then we listen. We no, our 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 kind of occupation then, as someone does, is not just to survive on alms food and all the rest. This is the end of itself. That that takes care of the kind of basics of the necessities uh, that we have to have: something to eat, you know, something to wear, roof over the head, and medicine for illness. But then we have now the occasion, the opportunity, not to just, we don't have to spend our lives just 
kind of trying to survive at a at a low level or having to uh, support ourselves but live in a simple way, simplify our life and develop the meditation, bhavana, cultivation, which is learning to relax and and listen, pay attention both internally and externally. And externally we're observing, not not criticizing or making judgments about I like this, I don't like that, but observing the way things are. And then internally we we can observe our own kind of uh, fears and desires of way our conceit operates, the way our, our, you know, various emotions arise and cease. And we can explore our own mind. We become aware of the edge where, where the th- thinking stops, thinking ceases. So I used to, you know, did a lot of uh, investigation of this, where the thinking ceases, and and really uh, used or developed all kinds of upayas or skillful means to deal with, to to be, to learn how to recognize, realize where there's no thought, because then I can, when when the thinking ceases. my feelings and my moods, making judgments, my intellectual mind's programmed to endlessly criticize my my moods, my emotions, my habits. And so if I'm if I'm just if I have no no cessation of thought, then all I can do is try to kind of rationalize my existence as a monk. Which doesn't it which isn't liberating. That isn't isn't the experience of liberation. So the the aim to to recognize first of all I recognize the cessation of thought. We were talking this afternoon at tea time about doubt and investigating the the state of not knowing, the experience of not knowing, not understanding, doubting, uncertainty. Where the the thinking process ceases and suddenly you're aware of non-thinking is like this. The gaps between thoughts, the gaps between words. So, then also in, uh, I use this uh, sound of silence develop this one found very helpful and many of you are using this now I hope to good effect but it it also is a sign where the the thinking mind ceases where you're at the edge uh, where the conditioning of the mind is no longer you're no longer caught in the conditioning of the mind and where you can and as you rest into that sound of silence more, relax into that silence, then you can be, you can really know what you're feeling. You know, this is the level of jitta of, of, uh, that you're experiencing in the present, whether you're feeling the, the mood is, is uh, happy or sad or pleasant or painful, whatever. Confused. Like uh, intuitive awareness uh, allows you to, like confusion, where uh, was saying the other day about uh, having this uh, one one afternoon fairly recently, uh, this uh, feeling, of this strong emotion, and I had this, uh, and my intellect was busily trying to kind of analyze this emotion, 
and uh, trying to kind of, you know, making making judgments about my emotional state. And then the emotion uh, was like this. So, just embracing both the intellectual uh, desire to to figure it out and the and the actual uh, feeling of that emotion. And the result was confusion. And so as I stayed with the confusion, then the confusion drops. And, and you are aware of the cessation. So you are realizing the cessation of, of emotional habits. Not getting rid of them or suppressing them, but with being aware when they are no longer present, no longer there. So, mindfulness is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a factor that isn't going up and down with the, with the conditions that you're experiencing. And that's why it, we, we have this, this refuge in this, in this awareness. The, it's the Buddha knowing the Dhamma, isn't it? the ability to, to pay attention to life as you're experiencing it, not as, not as some uh, abstraction, uh, but as life is as it is, you know, whatever way it feels for you, because it's it, that's the world as far as as the experience goes is what you're thinking, what you're feeling, whether it's crazy or sane or sensible or stupid or whatever. It doesn't. We're not. We're not judging it. We just notice it's like this. So there, there is the escape from the created, the condition, the born, the originate. Because there is the unborn, uncreated, unoriginate. So that's a real. That's realization. It's a. It's not. It's not an. It's not a, a Buddhist philosophical theory. It's a. It's realizable. It's reality, in other words. Now I'd ask myself over, in my monastic life over the years. I said, this has to be something practical. It just can't, you know, like the, oftentimes. The religion, religious teachings get get exalted to the point where you, you feel you no longer can make them work. And so, nibbana is one of those words in in the Buddhist world that gets exalted, gets put up on a pedestal. And uh, arahants and sotapanna's and all these are these are these are put on pedestals so that they they're so high that that then most of us uh, think they're just beyond our ability. But then is that what the Buddha was teaching? Worshipping, worshipping something on a pedestal. That we have faith in something up on a pedestal. Is that what he was teaching? Is it? Then any religion, you know, golden idols or you might as well worship, um, you know, beautiful golden goddesses on pedestals, something. <laughs> if, you're, if you're into worshipping things on pedestals. But, this is, but Nibbana isn't, isn't something refined, but, some, but it's subtle. So it, when it, 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 it's asking us to pay attention rather than to refine ourselves. The realization of neuro of the cessation. How does that work in practical as a practical thing in your life? And so I would, I just you know I'd, I'd try to, you know, witness that in that the, the cessation that goes on in my mind, the way things end in my mind. And I notice when I, when I really pay attention, and, we, and it's easy to easy enough to see with with uh, 
with with words, with thoughts. His thought moves very moves quite quickly. Or I develop these these deliberate thoughts, you know, and then think in a deliberate way so I can observe the gaps, the interstices, spaces between thoughts, between words, and the end. But then the the emotions they kind of linger, don't they? They hang around. They 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 have a lot of inertia. They kind of they they're not like they don't move so quickly. So you you're stuck with oftentimes moods, with feelings uh, uh, in your in your mind, in your body, in your heart, feeling of sadness or or despair or or resentment. So then the uh, intuitive awareness of that feeling is like this. And you go right into the feeling, totally embracing the emotional feeling, not judging it, analyzing it, but just letting it be like this. Like grief, for example, sense of the loss of somebody you love. It's like this. Like when my mother died, I really explored that sense of loss. It's like this. Rather than just trying to 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 smother the the emotion or ignore it, I really determined to grieve, to really know this feeling, embrace the whole the whole emotion of grief. And then through that then it, it naturally ceased. It wasn't wasn't repressed or forced. And uh, and I and I realized the cessation of a condition. Real I saw, I witnessed. I was there when it ended. So that's making it, putting it into practical, and then in, into practical uh, realizations. Nothing fantastic or, or, or all that difficult about it. This is your willingness to, to uh, do that, and your trust, your your confidence that you can do that. And then, then recognizing when grief ceased, there is peace. Like when that emotion was, the 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 when the, when it had finished, then there was a sense of this real peacefulness, bliss. Not not a kind of blissed out high, but uh, this a, a, a lovely feeling of emptiness, no self non-attachment and recognize realizing it's like that non-attachment is like this so you're 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 really informing your conscious life with wisdom all the time both in the presence with the presence of the condition the attachment to the condition and and the absence and non-attachment of the condition no both, not not no preference. We get greedy. I want just to. I just want to live in the state of nibbana, non-attachment, and uh, and and emptiness. And we attach. You know, we get. We we want that. We want. We we uh, we attach the idea of emptiness and and to the memories maybe we've had of those moments. That doesn't work either, because as far as as uh, our karma goes, we have to we 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 are like this. We're at that point of intersection. Isn't it? We, the the world, the conditioned realm, is very strong experience for us having a physical body like this, having senses and all the rest. It's, you know, this this is. Uh, this is what we this is what we have to accept the the world the conditioned realm as it is 
not try to escape from it because we don't like it and don't want to suffer and don't want to feel it and don't want to experience it anymore, but recognize it, realize it, its presence, and also recognize, realize non-attachment to it. When there's attachments like this, when there's non-attachment is like this. With meditation too, I, it, there's so many theories and views and types and that. About it. Oftentimes we we make it sound so so difficult and so uh, you know like years and years of hard work and sacrifice. Let <laughs> so that. If, if that's what we think, then that's probably what we'll experience. And we create that, don't we? That's the world we create. Uh, that we're, you know, and then we tend to, uh, that's what we tend to experience then. So, but it's not either, you know, getting enlightened quickly and then, uh, any, what any position you take, you can be aware of. Even, you know, we can even attach to the view of not being attached. You shouldn't be attached to anything, you people say. And then, uh, that, then we're attached to that view. <coughs> or all the views about meditation, about samatha, you have to get this, and then do vipassana, and then, you, then the pure vipassana, and uh, views about uh, all kinds of things that we uh, the views aren't necessarily the problem it's the attachment it's the commitment the the attachment taking refuge in views that blind us so even even attachment to the view of non-attachment will blind you so I used to try deliberately being attached to things just so I could re realize uh, and know what attachment like and deliberately attached you know, really you know instead of just saying oh I shouldn't be attached and kind of living my life in a kind of furtive way uh, don't dare attach and I, I would experiment with my attachments and really watch and feel them and feel uh, the, what it's like to really be attached to Things or people or ideas, you know, that really like the attachment to the form or attachment to the tradition. You know, how much suffering I created around my attachment to the tradition, you know, to to various members of the sangha, the, the kind of attachment I had, I I had towards these things, and then. The, but observing the, the the result of that attachment, and then through that, then you 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 realize the suffering that comes through attachment. Not, and so your your uh, non-attachment isn't coming from just some idea that you shouldn't be attached, but it's through understanding the you know when you grasp fire, it hurts the actual experience of it, you know, you naturally let go. Naturally don't attach to things that hurt when you know that they do. But if you don't know that then even attachment to the to the to the best of the conditioned realm, attachment to Buddhism, attachment to monasteries, or attachment to traditions, methods. None of these things are the problem in themselves, it's the attachment. Ubadana, dana ubadana, that is where we, we uh, uh, are most uh, blind. Uh, well you can see, never trust anybody that points to the condition. 
don't attach to that view either. <laughs> but do you know what attachment is? What does it feel like to be obsessed, to be really attached to views or opinions or people or places? What does it feel like? where you feel this obsession about them, compulsion, where you feel very anxious if they're ever threatened, or you feel angry, or you feel indignant, or you feel uh, jealous. You're worried, you know, anxious about this and that, because this changes, or this my, your, your pet, your favorite, your 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 commitment, your everything is bound up in this and it, and it might be threatened and you feel yourself going crazy with resentment or anger. That's, that's attachment. You know, that's the sign of attachment. And that very attachment isn't, we're not trying to get rid of it, but to understand it, know it, feel it, experience it. So then you, you know what you're talking about, you know, uh, and you, then you can, yeah, then you're letting go, isn't through aversion or fear or uh, about attachment, it's through understanding, through, wheel through, uh, and, and through, uh, realizing non-attachment is like this. Non-attachment is cool. It's, 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 and it's joyful. I notice in monastic life, when the, I get a lot of joy from monastic life when there's no attachment to it. When I start attaching to anything in this monastic system, then, then I don't get much joy out of this life. I could blame a monastic life, you know, or blame others. Or something, but then I know better. I know that that if I'm experiencing monastic life is uh, as, as onerous or difficult or hard or whatever, then it's because of an attachment I have. Where is that? What am I attached to then that's making my life so joyless and so miserable? And then I try to see, you know, I try to investigate there. What am I attached to now that's making me like, that makes me suffer like this? So the next few days we have the opportunity to practice together and, uh, discuss practice or whatever you want to do. Uh, what, till you're returning? What, Friday or Thursday night? This is the, we stay up till midnight tonight. So you're all invited to participate. <laughs>